Good day. I'm I'm Pyle, and now I'm with my colleague David. Hi, I'm David. And for the previous kernel recipes, I've been hitting on on this one, or at least mentioned a couple of times that the ideas bring around a zero copy and actual work. And now here we are talking about are you reading how it can help with zero copy? Zero copy is always a hot topic. Uh, are you doing, I believe, is cool as well, so. But before zero copy, I need to explain why do we even care about copies. Um, the, one of the big problems for the kernel is keeping up with ever growing performance of devices. Uh, if you are talking about networking in specific, we are looking at 400, 800 gigabit per second networking cards, and maybe even over terabit ranges in the future, not so far away future. And when you have so many data going through your system, copies do matter. Uh, not only it takes some time, uh, some memory, uh, memcopy takes a lot of CPU cycles. And also at our fleet, we've been seeing a lot of bottlenecks by the memory bandwidth and also PCI bandwidth. Um, what can we do? So surely the solution is not to do the copy and there should surely be something in the Linux kernel for that. And this actually is. Uh, a lot of different attempts or technologies doing that. The first one is zero copy receive. It actually receives and keeps the data in the kernel memory, but then it M maps. And how, and this M map is actually pretty expensive, especially for small payloads. So it's only applicable for, I believe, like hundreds of megabytes per M map. Uh, there are options for full bypass. There's also AFXDP, which is pretty, pretty cool, but I would call it a partial bypass. It doesn't uh, allow you to use the kernel networking stack. You, you have to provide your own uh, networking stack, like TCP in the user space, and uh, protocols like InfiniBands. Uh, And it, it should make you wonder what the, what the problem is. There's a lot of solution, but they are all coming with caveats. And for example, if you take storage, it's pretty simple. You pass an order rack and that's it. It's zero copy, it works well and the all, but it doesn't work as well for networking. And the problem is, is that with storage, when you do your IO, uh, it's the user space who initiates the I.O. Uh, and before that, the user space chooses the buffer to do the I.O. against. Uh, with the networking, it's a little bit different. The, uh, the data comes from some other end, from outside. And when it comes to the uh, networking card, networking card doesn't actually know uh, for which application this data uh, is destined. And we have no other option, but uh, I think honestly, copy the packet, stash it somewhere in the kernel, and then, then later on when application arrives, we'll copy it back to the uh, user space. So what can be done? Uh, just to give a little bit of a background how networking cards work. When the packet arrives, the networking cards need to find some place to copy the data into, to transfer it to the host system. It's usually, the allocation of this buffer is usually done through a ring shed between the networking card and the kernel. The driver pushes data into the string, and then when it's time, the networking card will take a buffer and, tr and fill it with data when it arrives. So, and with modern networking cards, they can keep multiple such rings. So what can we do? 
is to allocate one of such rings for ourselves and populate it with user memory. And when some traffic arrives, we'll copy into this user space buffer. And here's the first problem. First of all, we don't want someone else traffic to hit our user space memory. Because first of all, is it's a security problem. And otherwise, uh, if some data hits our queue, it will be uh, zero copy for the application it's destined for. We'll be using a lot of users, our user space memory provided. It will cause a lot of problems, and we will get zero copy at the end only in like a fraction of uh, the data, which is not good. And the other problem is that we don't want our traffic to steer it into some other queue for for more or less the same reason because we in which in this case we would uh, lose our zero copy. It will need to be copied back to the application in the end. Uh, to solve this problem, modern NICs are a little bit smarter. They have some. They have support for steering. So you basically specify for this IP and port. Uh, please put all the data into this uh, hardware ring of our networking card, which we allocated before. And we get the data, we allocate the, the buffer, and we pass it to the kernel stack. Uh, the second problem is that usually the networking stack was passing around struct pages. And because it's now user space pages, we can't really pass a user space page around like that because the kernel well, not completely true, but can put down the, uh, the struct page and deallocate it. Uh, and we don't really want to do it with the user buffer. Uh, we're also kind of modifying the lifetime of the buffer. We want to get it back at some point. So instead of it, we are now passing not a struct page, but a wrapper structure, which was added with the MemTCP. Uh, and networking now knows about uh, this extra structure called NetIO. Uh, after when application wants to receive this data and gets into the kernel, and instead instead of where it would be your usual uh, receive sys call with data copied into the, the application, we just return that this offset. Uh, this chunk of memory specified by offset and length in, in the user space memory which was provided in the very beginning contains some data you can go and process it. The user space will also know for which socket it arrives, like the for, for which file descriptor. Uh, so application takes a buffer, uh, processes it in some way, and eventually it needs to return it back to the kernel. That's done with another queue uh, called trifill queue, which is shared between the kernel and uh, user space. The user space pushes some buffers inside. Uh, then the kernel eventually transfers it and gives back to the networking card. So uh, I'm Kind of a little bit simplifying the picture. Just one thing to mention that instead of directly pushing our buffers to the networking card, there's a kernel object and entire infrastructure called page pool, which manages the buffers, uh, helps with caching, doing all this kind of interesting stuff. And on the IU ring side, uh, I'm not going to go into details too much but it will be it is a separate request type which is multi-shot if you know what it is basically for the user space from the user space perspective it sends just one request that sits in the kernel and pushes more and more data and the user space need to wait and 
uh, process the data that uh, the kernel pushes to the user space. Uh, if you know what multi-shot receive request in a ring is, it should be, it should look pretty familiar to you, and yeah, should be pretty simple. Um, now we can pass the stage to David for some sweet numbers and other details. So um, next I'll talk about some preliminary numbers that we obtained for, um, for our current latest iteration of uh, zero copy. And um, these were obtained on uh, this benchmark setup. It's an AMD-based system, which for those who know, it means that there's no Intel DDIO kind of getting in the way of uh, zero copy. And uh, the NIC that we're using is a, uh, a Broadcom 200G NIC. It's, uh, it's based on the Thor chipset. And for this particular NIC, um, it has hardware GRO turned on. And uh, we also left the um, IOMMU turned on as well. And our patches are based on uh, a fairly recent um, version of kernel 6.11. So for doing the, so the, the tool for doing the benchmark is uh, called KPerf. It's basically a slightly more sophisticated version of, uh, of IPerf. And um, it's actually maintained by one of the networking maintainers um, Jakub Kaczynski as well. And um, one of the main differences between this and iPerf is that um, iPerf, I think, just drops the payload on the ground, doesn't actually look at any of the payload that it has received, um, whereas KPerf is actually um, going to compare the payload. Uh, it basically it sends a repeating pattern, and it's going to compare the payload and make sure that there's no corruption happening. And it does this by using um, memcompare. And for the sake of uh, the benchmark, we're basically trying to see how fast can we push a single TCP connection. And um, also to, also KPerf has this feature where it can actually pin the CPU for, the, for your user space uh, worker thread separately to the, um, yeah, sorry, it can pin the soft RQ that's used for processing uh, the particular socket separate to the user space worker. So the first set of results, um, we're using a standard 1500 um, MTU. And uh, we, we run this for both um, ePoll, which is the standard implementation, and then IOU in zero copy, which is um, using our zero copy implementation. And we run this first um, with memcompare. And um, hopefully it's, uh, So hopefully it's um, self-explanatory. So for ePoll, we see that we get something like 68.8 gigabits per second out of um, out of our NIC. And then for IOU in zero copy, we get 90.4 gigabits per second, which is a roughly 31% increase. And um, we can see the some CPU utilization numbers uh, on this side. So in all cases, um, the worker the, the CPU that's actually running our user space thread is basically maxed out 100%, um, and we can. And this is the CPU utilization for um, a different CPU core that is going to be running our NetSoft RQ. Cool. And then um, when we disable memcompare, we can see that the um, the effective bandwidth goes up. So for EPOL, we get 74 gigabits per second, and then for IOU in zero copy, we get roughly 106 gigabits per second for a 43% increase. And we can see that the, the CPU utilization for IOU ring goes up, right? Because we're basically driving way more, um, we're driving way more packets through the, uh, through the networking stack. So this is a set of numbers for um, when we change the MTU to, to 4K, which is the page size for the system. So again, we can see that IOU ring um, is significantly faster using zero copy compared to uh, compared to EPOL. And um, this is just a bonus set of results. Um, remember how I said that with KPerf, we're, we're, we're pinning uh, the worker and the soft RQ on different CPUs. So what happens when we put it on the same CPU? Um, again, we can see that the CPU is completely maxed out. And um, yeah, IOU ring is 
using zero copy is going to be about 29, 30% faster compared to, uh, compared to EPOM. Cool. All right, so next I want to talk a little bit about um, networking. So it's to support zero copy, you can't just turn it on on any system. You, you, you need explicit support from um, very specific NICs, um, very specific firmwares, and also changes to drivers. Um, so Pavel mentioned that uh, we need to be able to steer the flows that we desire into very specific queues, and we have to set up very specific queues for, uh, for doing zero copy. Um, so this means that we need um, some hardware, uh, some hardware offloads. So I'm going to talk about some of the changes that are made to the, um, to the networking um, system, subsystem, and what changes need to be made to drivers in order to um, support using zero copy. All right, so um, you know, before all of this, there's only there's only pages in the networking stack. So the networking stack just deals with struct pages, um, but now we're adding user space memory into the mix. And um, Pavel also mentioned something called TCP devmem, and this is a similar effort from uh, folks at Google. And this is basically zero copying, um, not to user memory, but to uh, device memory like GPUs. So uh, with that kind of landscape, we have now three different types of memory in the networking stack. We've got struct pages, as before, representing uh, kernel host memory. We have um, uh, now user space memory as well. There's still struct pages. And then you've got device memory, and uh, which is used by TCP um, devmem. So we need a new kind of abstraction to represent you know, arbitrary memory types, because it could be any of those three. And to do that, uh, something called netmem ref was added. And so for, so a netmem is either a page or a something called a net IOV. And then a net IOV could be um, a user page in our case, or it could be device memory in devmem, uh, in TCP devmem's case. So the netmem ref is just, um, yeah, it's just a non-existent kind of into marking, marking the fact that it's not just a page. So what is a net IOV? A net IOV, um, it, it basically shares the same header as a struct page. And uh, the way that we differentiate it is that we mark the LSB with a single bit. So, um, so, if, you, so if you get a net mem and you check the LSB and it's one, then it's a net IOV. And if it's a zero, then it's a page. And the networking stack has um, as all the helpers kind of change to, to support this, you can convert netmems to net IOVs and netmems to pages, and it will tell you um, when you're trying to convert it into something that is not. And the main reason that we need a net IOV is that uh, the lifetime of the pages, uh, we cannot just leave it to the kernel now, right? Because, um, because we cannot free those pages, we cannot recycle those pages until we know that the user has uh, read them and done something with it before it's returned back to us. So that's the kind of the, the main purpose for adding something um, like a net IOV. Cool. All right. Um, the other thing that drivers need to support is this thing called a net dev uh, queue API. So I'll first go over um, kind of like the landscape today about how uh, hardware queues are working Nix and uh, why that's a problem for what we're trying to do and the kind of direction that um, we in the networking community are moving towards. So, uh, Pavel mentioned that NICs now have um, a large number of queues, you know, upwards of 128 queues, and we need this to support the ever-increasing uh, speeds that NICs are getting to. Uh, the problem right now is these queues are configured in an all-or-nothing fashion. They are set up at the start of the device, and that's it. Like, you can't just um, create these queues arbitrarily. And uh, they're also configured in exactly the same way. So you have a single configuration that's applied to all queues. And whenever you change any of the configurations, it means you have to bring the device down and then go up again, which means that you're going to interrupt any traffic that is flowing. And um, another problem with drivers is that it often likes to allocate um, memory for its hardware queues after it brings the device down. And that, you know, when you have 128 queues, that allocation could take you know 20, 30 seconds, so um, it's uh, it's not a very efficient way of of, of doing things. All right. So why is that a problem for us? So 
we need to configure very specific queues for zero copy. So right now, that means every time we want to set a queue and turn it on, uh, we have to bring the whole device down, which is um, <coughs> which is not very uh, which is not very acceptable. Um, the other problem is that the, uh, the the flow steering rules are managed completely separately to the queue. So there's no way to kind of tie the lifetime of certain objects in the networking stack together around the queue. Um, so you know what we would really like is to have a uh, queue API. We call it a queue API, and this um, you know makes the queue like a first-class citizen in the kernel. Uh, make it something that you can just create dynamically and destroy. Um, it means that you can tie uh, configuration not for all queues, but you know change uh, very specific configuration for uh, specific queues that you want to configure for things like IOU in zero copy or TCP devmem. And it means that we can group the lifetime of certain um, objects together, like uh, flow steering rules and RSS contacts. And finally, um, it means that uh, we can just we can create these queues without affecting all the other queues and any traffic that is you know, flowing through them. So to do that, uh, the, the kind of early steps to uh, this queue API is something called a net dev, net dev queue management ops. Uh, there are two sets of uh, two functions. The first two are allocating and deallocating the uh, queue memory that I, that I mentioned. So, so this is memory for, um, this is memory that is shared with the hardware that represent the hardware, uh, the, the hardware queues. And then there is also a uh, queue start and queue stop function that takes a specific index. And this means that you only restart this specified queue as opposed to what I said earlier where um, any changes means bringing the whole device down. And this is a, um, this function, netdev rxq restart. This is one of the new helpers that we have added that kind of consumes this queue API. And um, without going into too much details, basically this provides, um, this provides an overall structure in the netdev core uh, to, the, uh, to the specific um, devices and it enforces the order of operations, right? So um, remember how I said that devices just out of laziness probably, they like to stop everything, deallocate, reallocate and start, which is not the most optimal ordering of operations. So here you can see that you know this function is enforcing at the allocation of the new queue memory before you stop the existing queue. And then you kind of do like a, a swap and this could be done very quickly because you're just changing some pointers. And then after the new queue um, has been brought up, then we free the old memory, right? So this is basically um, NetDev Core prescribing a better order of operations for, uh, for devices. So yeah, so like I mentioned, um, support for IOU in zero copy depends on hardware, depends on firmware, depends on drivers. So this is kind of the, the state of the land um, today. So we are targeting Broadcom BNXT, and um, this is going to work for any of their NICs that have Thor and uh, later versions of their, uh, of their chipset. And Google GVE is, um, is a NIC that is used in their Google Cloud services, Google Cloud provider, GCP. And um, since they support TCP DevNem and TCP DevNem uh, has the same requisite prerequisites as us, um, we, you know, once we merge um, our U in zero copy, then it's going to work for that as well. And then for uh, Mellanox MRX5 drivers, um, I think it's going to work on anything that is um, CX7 and later. And um, I'm actively working with Mellanox to get this support um, into, their, into their drivers and firmware. Cool. All right, so the next part, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, if you want to use this as a user, what would it, what would it involve to actually switch your application to um, using IOU in zero copy? So the first thing is, um, unfortunately, you have to set up your NIC um, to for you have to set up your NIC to uh, make it work. And like I mentioned, um, this has to be done separately today using FTOR. It's not something that is tied together uh, with IOU ring. So first of all, you set, um, you set your NIC to have a certain number of queues. In this case, I set it to 24. 
and then this command is going to carve out the um, it's going to carve out the first 12 queues for receiving um, ordinary traffic. So um, every anything that is not zero copy. And then this uh, command here is going to um, create a flow steering rule that is going to match on the destination port. So any uh, traffic that is arriving on the server port 9999 is going to be directed into uh, Q13. It's it's zero index, so that's why that says 12. And um, you know later on when we set up our server, we're going to make sure that we listen on this port that we've specified. And then when we configure zero copy, we're going to make sure that we set it for um, for Q13. Cool. So onto the setup, um, the, the the very first thing that you have to do is you have to pre-allocate uh, some user space memory that is going to actually receive um, the the packets. So this memory will be given to the kernel, and then we're going to um, you know chunk it up, give it to the uh, give it to the the driver. The driver is then going to make that available to the hardware, and that's where we're going to receive our packets. Then we have a registration struct where we're passing the, um, the, the pointer to the memory that we've allocated. Pretty self-explanatory. And then uh, this is the main registration struct, and you can see that we, um, we specify the, um, the Q13 here, and uh, the if index is going to be the, the if the, the if index of our network card. And finally, we call a register IFQ uh, function to um, to kind of set up zero copy for uh, for this hardware queue. And um, yeah, IFQ stands for interface queue. So um, as part of the registration process, um, IO Euring in the kernel is going to map um, memory for the refill queue that Pavel mentioned. Uh, the refill queue will be used for user space to hand back any buffers that it has finished with. And um, this is very similar to the, um, to the submission queue and the completion queue in IO Euring. And um, user space will do a, uh, do a map to so the kernel allocates the memory, and then uh, user space then um, maps the maps into the ring, and um, that ring is then shared between the user and the kernel. Cool. So that's all the setup done. Um, the next step is to prepare the request. This is pretty similar to any other IOU ring request. Um, we have a new opcode here called receive CC, and um, once you prepare the request, you go ahead and submit it into the ring and uh, wait, for, wait for the completion. So in order to process the completions, um, it's going to come in two parts. Um, the first part is a standard IOU ring completion entry. And um, the second part, so we, we, we're taking advantage of, a, of this feature in our IOU ring called a big CQE. So normally a CQE is only 16 bytes. But now um, we use 32-byte CQEs. The top half is going to be your standard um, CQE. And the bottom half is going to be this new structure called a ZCRX CQE. And um, what's inside is basically an offset. And this is the offset relative to the start of the, um, of the memory region that you allocated for doing zero copy. So if I go back. Right, so it's, um, it's, it's relative to this particular address here. Right, so um, yeah, we simply get a CQE. We then um, take the bottom 16 bytes and get the, uh, get the zero copy completion structure. And then from the offset, we can compute uh, the pointer to where the actual data is. So processing here is not so much like receiving, uh, like copying the data or receiving the data. It's just like a notification mechanism to tell user space, hey, um, the data for you is over here. Go look at it. Cool. And then uh, user space, once it receives, receives the data, you're going to do something to it. And then once you're done, you want to, um, it will be refilled, right? 
to, to give it back to the kernel so that we can put it back into the, um, make it back available to the, uh, to the NIC. And to do that, we have, um, remember, we mapped a separate refuel ring, and each ring um, consists of one of these structures called a um, refuel queue entry, I guess you could call it. And um, yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's, um, you basically put the offset alongside something called a uh, area token to kind of identify which area um, back into the queue. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you, you write it into one of the entries, and then um, much like the completion queue, sorry, much like the submission queue, um, you make it available to the kernel by using a, uh, by using a write once. So now um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the user space challenges faced when trying to um, when trying to implement um, IU in zero copy with with services. So um, what do I mean by challenges? Well, removing um, a copy here from the kernel to the user is um, is all well and good, but it's no good if the user has to add back a copy and. Sometimes this is necessary um, for, for, for two main reasons that I found. The first one is uh, decrypting TLS uh, encrypted traffic. And the second one is um, alignment issues when it comes to storage-based um, services. And um, so, so these two operations can often be combined with the copy, right? So we have to bear these in mind. So first, I'll talk about um, encryption. So for plain text, um, the main benefit of um, of zero copy is that it, you know you, you only need one hop over the memory bus. So from the NIC, um, from the NIC, once it receives payload data, it only has to make a single trip over the uh, over the memory bus, and then we put it straight into user memory where it's available. So that's only one trip, and that's where a lot of the benefits come from. But um, as soon as you have um, encrypted traffic, you have you can't just do anything with that data, you have to decrypt it. And that means you have to allocate uh, new memory and you have to do a decryption into that new memory, which means doing another copy. So there's a feature in the kernel called uh, KTLS, and this means that the kernel is going to be um, decrypting the traffic for you. And for KTLS, it's actually possible to combine the uh, kernel to user copy with decryption. So the net effect is that, um, yeah, there are, there are, you, you still need two trips over the, uh, you still need two trips over the memory bus. So it's the same for the zero copy and TLS case, right? So it's, um, we're, we're, we're not really doing any, any better here. And I think the, the best solution to this is something called PSP. Um, it's, if you're not aware, PSP, I think it stands for PSP security protocol. It's uh, it's something that Google have open sourced, and basically it's like stateless hardware um, crypto offload. So um, with something like PSP, and, I, and the NICs that I mentioned that support zero copy will also support PSP. Um, what what PSP will allow you to do is we we go back to this um, we go back to this model where there's only one trip over the over the memory bus, because the NIC is going to um, uh, decrypt the packet before it kind of sends it into um, the user memory here. So at this point, it's already plain text. So I think this is the most kind of ideal, ideal solution for dealing with crypto. The uh, the second problem is around um, alignment. So imagine that you have some uh, block storage service, a big distributed service that's just storing blocks of 4 KB. Um, and this is all sent over RPC with um, that, that, you know, you're, it's framed around a uh, RPC request. So here you have the, the 4KB payload, and then maybe you've got some metadata here and here on, on, on each side. So the problem is that on the sender side, um, the, the frame is going to be segmented into, uh, into MSS. So um, could be this could be 1500 or this could be 4k or it could be anything in between and it's not something that we uh, we can control and then on the receiver side um, there's we 
in the most ideal case, we want to use something uh, like odirect, uh, which means that we can write this payload to disk without needing to do um, another copy. And odirect only works. Uh, well, odirect does work with I of X, so it's possible um, even if the data is split into um, three distinct regions. However, there is a requirement that um, each of these addresses for the start of each chunk, um, I think it has to be aligned to four bytes or, or two bytes. And um, so like I mentioned, we don't really control how this is split up on the sender side. And it's also very difficult to control. Um, each NIC does it slightly differently. It's very difficult to control how the NIC kind of reassembles um, how it reassembles the frame on the receiver side. So um, there are some optimi optimizations like hardware GRO, where the NIC will try to combine um, smaller packets into like one super packet. And uh, that behavior is not something that we control. So what I'm trying to say here is um, it's possible that after we receive the frame with zero copy, we still have to do another copy in order to create the correct alignment before that data could be written to disk. So. All right, and um, the, the kind of final problem that, uh, that I've encountered when trying to integrate this is around um, basically there is a finite number of hardware queues. Um, for example, for the, the Broadcom NICs, they have something like 128 queues. And on, the AMD, on some of the AMD systems, you're going up to something like 200 cores, right? So um, we currently kind of associate hardware queues one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one with um, IO Ewing instances, and each IO Ewing is driven um, by a single thread. So when you have CPUs with more than 128 cores, it's like, well, what can you do? You need to have, um, in order to make use of those CPUs, you have to share, you know, you have to share something. And this is um, this is currently like an, like an open question on um, how to deal with it. Cool. All right, so uh, I'm done, and I'm going to hand it off to Pavel to tell us uh, what's new and exciting and coming up. Uh, yeah, first, just a little, a little bit of note about the user space API. Mm -hmm. It was more like what it should look like from the kernel perspective, but LibreUring should hide most of the details behind. So it would be a little bit more convenient to use them the, a mapping by hand, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's must. Uh, the RFC for our patches were flying around for quite a long time. Uh, we were actually hoping to send something non-RFC just before the conference, but unfortunately our dependencies with DevMem and such got merged just uh, like uh, two weeks ago, just at the end of the window, previous release window. So we expect to try to merge it uh, right after the conference and we will be sending something simplified, something more easily mergeable and there will be uh, some follow-up work and ideas around, like your general optimization, some ideas floating around about ref counting. Uh, there are some pretty low hanging fruit around, huge pages, chunky a little bit differently. Some hardware vendors like Melanox were proposing some interesting ideas as well. Uh, we will be also adding a lot of more features on top of it, like dynamically adding more memory uh, to the system, to the zero copy system uh, when it's needed. Extend it to DMA bar, using DMA buff for peer-to-peer -peer transfer, saving PCI express bandwidth, all this kind of stuff. Uh, David just mentioned sharing uh, single thread works well for, let's say, if you have a lot of hardware queues in your networking card or, how, uh, or some dedicated CPUs for networking processing. Otherwise, to extend our use cases a little bit more, we will need to add some more sharing. And yeah, expect purchase somewhere after the conference. Uh, there are some links for our I would say pretty outdated uh, patches, also the more or less recent branches and yeah, links for benchmarking, 
so you can try it yourself and yeah if you have any more questions if you need to discuss something any more proposal please go ahead to contact us yeah thank you questions there's one um, as a user land developer uh, I'm a bit confused about how I could make use of it um, it's a bit complicated I mean that at these load levels on the network uh, what I'm used to see is uh, essentially HTTP traffic so typically, uh, my use case is a proxy which serves as a gateway between the internet and internal servers. And uh, the highest Rx bandwidth is between the internal, the origin servers, internal servers, and the proxy itself. You see, it's a load balancer. So uh, you retrieve the, uh, hundreds of gigabit of traffic uh, from there. So it typically falls in this use case. However, the traffic is uh, spread over tens to hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, connections. So uh, I'm not sure I will be able to configure a NIC uh, to uh, set that many rules uh, of that many connections uh, to direct them to a specific queue. And even if it were possible, because we can imagine that some NICs will evolve in this direction, uh, it can cost a lot because uh, if you establish uh, maybe a, a 1,000 connections per second uh, constantly, uh, it can cost a lot to you know, constantly reconfigure the NIC. Um, and, uh, and the other approach could probably be to say, okay, then we will put the rule based on the server's IP and source port to uh, direct the incoming traffic, but in this case, it would prevent multiple processes from joining the same server, or they would have to, ch to share their, uh, their queues. So I'm, a, I'm, not sh I'm not seeing how I could use it, and it's not specific to your API or to your development. I mean, it's more uh, a limitation of the, what you explained on the fir very first slides, that uh, the NIC does not know uh, upfront where to deliver the data. Mm -hmm. You see, yeah. Yeah. it's kind. Of, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if, in fact, we should not try to uh, change the relation between the hardware and the software. I mean that maybe uh, we could imagine that uh, some NICs uh, would uh, systematically write the five tuple in the descriptor and only report the descriptor to the stack, and from there the network stack would be able to look up. Uh, what uh, application is bound to it uh, and retrieve the buffer which would have been pre-configured by the application and uh, ask the NIC to deliver uh, the, con the equivalent content the, uh, into that buffer. It would be a second round trip on the PCI. Uh, it would require the NIC to buffer a lot of data, of course, uh, but at least it would uh, allow uh, multiple applications to, uh, to run in zero copy in parallel uh, with uh, some kernel assistance and uh, one extra round trip, but a small one for the descriptor and a large one for the data, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the problems that steering is expensive. If you add too many rules, it will be expensive for the networking card and networking card will lose performance. And there's a limited number of rules you can add in the first place. Uh, if you would usually be expected in some masking, right? Uh, like uh, steer all the traffic for this port or from this IP or something like that to our queue. If it doesn't work, yeah. So, so the way that I would um, I would do it is um, you wouldn't just use a single queue. Well, like one queue would not be enough to drive mm -hmm. all the traffic. Um, so there is you can create something called an RSS context. And this is basically, uh, it, it, you can group um, a number of queues together into like one context. And you can actually steer flows into that RSS context. So imagine that you had a NIC with 128 queues. You could carve out, let's say, um, 100 of them for your web application. And you can, you, with, a single, with a single rule, listening on port 80, and one rule listening on port 443 for HTTP, um, you can steer traffic into that particular context. 
the problem in this case is that uh, port 80 and 443 are not usable because uh, they would receive traffic from the client which is always very small in http the, the most of the traffic comes from the server so uh, you have uh, tens uh, 10,000 ports opened uh, from the gateway to the servers and to multiple servers. So you would still need to put uh, many, many rules just to match these connections. Mm -hmm. I see. You by, see? The, by the end of the day, they cannot really allow with this approach, uh, like infinite number of different applications uh, and each trying to allocate uh, the zero copy engine. Uh, and unless I think the unless we are willing to change the protocols, which is a problem. Uh, I don't think there is much to be done. Uh, some ideas were to use BPF, for example, inside the networking card, but it's expensive. Nobody is willing to do it at three bit per second ranges. Nobody is going to run any code, less so BPF inside. And I noticed a second point, which maybe you would be interested in uh, take, uh, having a look, at, a look at, sorry, which is the use of bonding, because at uh, high traffic rates, often uh, the traffic is monetized, I would say, and uh, you want to avoid the slightest uh, outage, and I'm seeing um, very often that bonding is used, at least in active backup mode, uh, so that you don't lose a link. And there is a new difficulty which comes in this case, which is that if you uh, assign your buffer to a NIC, in fact, you don't know upfront which NIC will receive the traffic in case uh, of a switchover of the, the port. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure there are, there are ways to solve this, but I don't know how. Mm. Yeah, so I would say that like in the beginning, we wouldn't support, we wouldn't support bonded NICs. Mm. Maybe sometime in the future we can share between different devices the memory and then you get it back. Mm -hmm. um, so this patch series is still being uh, worked on. Do you, do you get feedback from the network developers what they think of your approach? Uh, you're already at V5. Do you have any idea of the schedule on when it could be merged? Um, it depends how it goes. Previous RFC haven't got any controversial uh, feedback, I would say. Uh, we'll try to send it, the, uh, we will send it this uh, release window. I cannot really tell how fast it's, it will be merged, but the beauty of it is that all dependencies will merge with DevMemTCP. And apart from DevMemTCP, we don't really change almost anything from the networking side, nothing in the hot pass, nothing in the generic networking stack, so should be a pretty easy decision for the net dev at least. Uh, what's, what's the status of MemTCP? I did not follow. It's merged. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It finally went in um, just before Plumbers. Thank you. Everyone's ready for dinner. Okay, thank you.